Listen to Alfred. A Shaftesbury man has returned safely from the Round the World Yacht Race. 71-year-old Tim Chappell sailed the 5,200 nautical miles between Cape Town and Perth. He says the experience has changed his life. Tim saw some incredible sights as his 70-foot yacht forged through the 60-foot waves of the Roaring Forties and the Southern Indian Ocean, from Africa past Antarctica and on to Australia. Yes, I saw fin whale, humpback whales albatrosses, terns, petrels, sky at night. Yeah, you see all the stars that you want to see. And it was interesting. We were all discussing which was which and uh, what was going on. At times, Tim's yacht was closer to the International Space Station than it was to the land, and it was rough and tough on the ocean. The boat would be over at an angle, uh, quite a steep angle. You'd be sort of virtually looking down at your feet, and then the sea would be a couple of inches beyond it. Um, perception wise uh, but that wasn't a worry I was never phased in fact I did say to the skipper why was it that I the rougher it became the more I enjoyed it he said because your awareness your danger awareness increased and your excitement and adrenaline increased therefore you enjoyed it more and I did and I, everybody on the boat the rougher it was the better it was in most conditions uh, 50% of the crew at time the first week or so were ill I was not fortunately I never liked being down below but I sorted myself out with ginger pills and stuff like that so that was fine. Were some of the crew then in- incapacitated for a long time? For a week um, or so yes uh, there were a lot of buckets being filled and emptied um, there was one guy who was renamed nicknamed as a pterodactyl because of the way he was sick the sounds he made <laughs> so that was that was quite funny before the race following training on the solent tim said he wanted to perform as well as a 20 year old crew member but on the water off africa he realized that ambition wasn't entirely realistic when i was uh, crawling onto the uh, foredeck where the bounces up and down a lot where a couple of cells are um, I was allowed to do whatever work was necessary there, but in future it was advised that perhaps no old men should go on the fore deck because it does bounce around a lot and it needs a lot of agility and strength. And I just frankly did not have that agility and strength, so I used to let the younger ones get on and do it. They wanted to, they had the strength, they had the agility, why not let them do it and I'll do something else. Tim has relived some of the tough experiences caught on camera. There's a film on YouTube of me getting out, being born out of the hatch, coming out of the companionway down below. It, there's only, it's about, only about a two foot six gap, square gap, and you're supposed to double up with your legs and back and bend, and it's very difficult to get out of. Others obviously younger than me could do it quite easily, but I just sometimes often throw myself out and crawl across the deck. Tim was warned there'd be no home comforts on board, and his trainers weren't joking. Most people would think that it's uncomfortable, yes, because there's no showers, there's no heating, there's no cooling, there's no seats on the toilets. The only way of uh, cleaning yourself is with wet wipes and the food is, if you don't like the food, you don't eat it. If I was too tired, I went straight to bed, not bothering with food. I sometimes wore my wet clothes in bed. The crew worked miracles in the cramped kitchen, where it was stiflingly hot. Team members on cooking duties coped with the 45 Celsius heat by stripping to their underwear. That's a concern when using hot oil in a confined space on the churning seas. A lot of the food was dried. There was some fresh food which we could use for the first 10 days to a fortnight. Um, That gradually obviously petered out. But yes, the diet was fantastic. I had three occasions on which I could partner with someone else to be what what we call a mother or the cook and we work from we get up at half past five in the morning we finish about 10 o'clock at night and we're there continually throughout the day providing food and drinks for everyone else in the crew I was fortunate in so far as my mother partner did allow me to have an hour or two sleep in the morning and in the afternoon and vice versa because we were both so so tired When Alfred interviewed Tim in November, the former GCHQ spook and Dorset Police Special Sergeant knew how dangerous the clipper race was. He said there was a real possibility that he could drown. People have died on this voyage before. One of Tim's crew colleagues had a hand crushed by block and tackle, and there were more significant injuries. One of our other crew members, he fell over on deck 
and uh, suffered a broken jaw, broken teeth, broken nose, um, cut around the eyes and forehead, etc. So he was quite badly injured. A life-threatening emergency meant the crew had to drop out of the competitive race. He developed appendicitis and we had it confirmed by the medical provider Praxis that it was and he was drugged up, morphine, etc. and we were advised to go into um, the nearest possible South African port. Bearing in mind, we just reached 40 degrees south near Antarctica. So there, that was after six days. So then we had to take another five, six days, whatever it was, to go to Durban and to drop him off. They operated on him within two hours of arriving in Durban and it was found he had severe sepsis, which is, uh, infection through the body and from the uh, appendix and which was leaking and if it had burst it probably would have killed him within half an hour an hour so we got there just in time with him we could say we saved a life naturally on board everyone's hearts and souls sank because the race had finished we were not actually in a proper healed over hard race with other boats but we had to save somebody's life. There was one side effect of the crossing that Tim wasn't prepared for. Hallucinations caused by sleep deprivation. After about four or five days of four hours on, four hours off if you were lucky, and with perhaps just a few hours sleep, I started seeing red double-decker London buses landing on the sea. There's no land within sight, bearing in mind after a couple of hours of leaving Cape Town. And I started seeing planes landing and dogs walking and people walking on the sea. And being extremely tired, nothing could prepare me for that. Tim says he'll never forget another strange experience which wasn't caused by his imagination. Before the yacht headed off on their 33-day voyage, the crew took part in a race from Cape Town Harbour. And we had a short course, just a few miles around, boys, so that the people on shore could see what the racing was like and I enjoy that racing because you're within meters of other boats we took about 70 foot long boats 90 foot masts 22 to 24 crew on each boat and I was occasionally up to my waist in water because we were hilled over so much and I was hanging on somebody was hanging on to me I was also tethered on to the boat to make sure I didn't go overside and then I noticed the water formed the shape of a hand and opened up the flap of my pocket uh, my trouser pockets and took out my wallet and deposited it in the sea in the bay I couldn't do a single thing about it because I couldn't let go um, or I would have fallen down and been injured so that was interesting it was really like a smooth hand just putting its lifting the flap up and going inside the pocket i don't know i don't know to this day how it managed to do that when tim arrived at Fremantle near perth on the 20th of december his legs were wobbly from spending over a month at sea even when sleeping in his bunk his muscles had been working sometimes fighting the yacht's movement so he was exhausted even when Tim came ashore, it took some time before he could enjoy a refreshing night's sleep. But I couldn't stay asleep for longer than about two hours. And it's taken about two weeks, two and a half weeks, to get over the f exceedingly heavy fatigue. I had not realised how uh, strenuous it would be on the body and mind. Now back home in Shaftesbury, Tim is eight kilos lighter than in November. Couldn't eat food at Christmas. I couldn't eat very much at all because my stomach had shrunk because I was used to having perhaps porridge in the morning, possibly no lunch and possibly no evening meal, but just snacks and bits and pieces. It's realising that I was quite a lot overweight. I had a high BMI of 31, 32 and so therefore I've got to keep that weight down, keep it off, lose more weight, um, which I intend to do. and. It's shown me that even losing 10 kilos, which is what, five two pound bags of sugar, is it, or something like that? Even that is so essential for everyone. Tim had plenty of time to think about life and the people he loves when he was on board. And he says after reflection, he's determined to change his behavior in 2020. And I did have uh, one major epiphany moment about my partner, whom uh, I should have been, uh, I think, a lot nicer to in the last few years. So I've realised what I've got to do 
to change myself in, in view of the Asperger's uh, analysis which I had over a year ago, which explains a lot of things about my attitude. Tim was fundraising for UNICEF, and before he set sail, he took a two-hour drive from Cape Town to visit the Isabindi Family and Child Safe Park. It's run by the South African government and supported by the charity. It provides a home for disadvantaged children and their parents. Visiting the site was one of the most moving experiences Tim can recall. You arrive at this camp where there's hundreds and hundreds of tin shacks. We went to one tin shack and I left it because I was disgusted. I felt too rich. But there were four people, two adults and two children, living in something about eight foot by 12 foot. No running water, no toilets. They went to the toilet in the street. We had to step over urine and everything just walking, flowing down the street. And it wasn't a street, it was just the hillside. But they, the family, were quite wanted us to see how they were living and how, what they had to do, I uh, suppose, to help us to raise money and they'd have perhaps one meal a day or they were the children would be given at the school that we went round a fantastic school fantastic carers there and fantastic teachers very eloquent students who wanted to run south africa because they could see all the corruption and uh, the money wasn't being distributed fairly in, in their estimation it really hit home when i went went to tesco's in shaftesbury and to get some food on christmas eve and everybody was scrambling around for food. I just put my food down and left. I was so disgusted that I was actually buying food for myself when there were other people in the world who didn't have enough just for one meal a day. So you left to Christmas shopping? Yeah. That's changed me. I intend to continue working with UNICEF and getting my son's school in New Milton, that's a United Nations Respect School, to hopefully work with that safe camp in Cape Town. It's a shame it's taken a trip like that to make a person realise that how rich I am. I don't have any money, but I am in comparison. And I get disgusted when fundraising for wealthy people and they have dinners and they spend thousands and thousands of pounds on these dinners to raise money for charity. Great raising money for charity, but why bother with the dinner? Tim is pleased that UNICEF will benefit from his efforts and the work of his teammates. Yeah, raised. About 63%, £1,243 of my 2000 uh, target. Um, as a boat, about 140, 150% of our target, mainly due to our surgeon who's circumnavigating the world. She's Holly Williams, she's from America. She a, was a trauma surgeon, but she's a paediatric surgeon. Just apparently before she left, she separated conjoined twins. So uh, she's a fantastic um, person and surgeon, and she managed to raise, I think, a little over £11,000 uh, from her medical colleagues in America, which was fantastic. But the fundraising as a whole, we're hoping to raise across the whole fleet at least £1 million, hopefully £2 million pound for UNICEF. Tim says he's forged at least two enduring friendships from the experience. He shared a berth, hot bunking, with an ex-Royal Naval Commodore, and he also became good friends of the owner of a pharmaceutical company. It was a great experience, a great adventure, and something I'd encourage everyone to do if they could. You can still support Tim's fundraising by following the Just Giving link, which you'll find on the This Is Alfred website. Listen to Alfred.